morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Marikan. I'll be your host and uh, moderator today. Uh, thank you very much for attending our webinar workshop today. It will be a uh, time well spent uh, on a Saturday morning, I promise you, because we have two outstanding speakers who are well worth your time listening to. Our talk today is titled Collaboration, Export of Professional Services, which is part of a series on collaboration among architects. And today is the fourth edition. Collaboration among architectural firms is not a new thing. However, it has not been the preferred option for many of our firms to market their services. For that reason, our Institute PAMS, Promotion of Professional Profession Committee, Promotion of Profession Committee, which is better known as POP. Well, we have come up with a series of workshops to explore the collaborative option as a way for us architects to study its potential, not only as a marketing tool, but as a viable means to provide better services by having more creative combined ideas perhaps, and by being able to refer to each other's experience and expertise. In the previous uh, edition of our workshop, Cam has invited three architectural firms who work together to uh, deliver Parcel F in Putrajaya, and uh, another sole proprietor firm uh, which uh, talked about uh, gig economy uh, with the Industrial Revolution 4.0 technology and uh, unlocking new values. Today, we are going to touch on another form of collaboration which is more on the export of professional services. Today, I'm, uh, we are honored to have architect David Mizan Hashim, group founder, president and director of Veritas Architects Design Group and architect Ben Yeo, founder of BYG Group. They will be sharing their thoughts and experience on the topic of exporting their services to give us some ideas as to how they have successfully expanded their services to reach overseas market. Before we start, I'd like to invite uh, our president, Datu architect, Azumi Harzani, to say a few words. Uh, Datu Izumi. Hey, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Let me try to turn on my video. Jeff, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yes, yes, we can, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, so, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Okay, I think, um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank also my uh, committee co-chair, architect Saifuddin Ahmad, architect Lilian Tay, Amy, uh, architect Amy Roslan, and all the committee member of promotion of profession, a uh, pop committee for this effort. And uh, to all members of Utuba Architect Malaysia, Pam, and their friend, Assalamualaikum, Selamat Pagi, and good morning. Uh, last year, around uh, October, on 16 October 2021, we had our PAM uh, Promotion of Practice Committee uh, workshop uh, 3.0, which was talking about collaboration among architects in delivering projects in Malaysia. But today, I would like to welcome you to POP Virtual Workshop 4.0, a sharing session on collaboration experiences in getting into international market. Uh, we are happy to have none other than architect David Mizan Hashim, the founder and president of Veritas Design Group, and also architect Ben Jo Huan Bang, uh, the, founder, the founder of BYG Group. Uh, Pam wishes to thank both speakers for accepting our invitation to reveal their secrets in venturing into the international market. I am sure our members are eager to know how Davy and Ben managed to put things together in doing work with overseas architects and clients. I know that it is not easy, sometimes it can be challenging, especially uh, coordinating the construction work uh, with the uh, international or foreign foreign uh, contractors and also consultants. Uh, just for your information that my own practice used to have offices in Shanghai and Beijing, but due to high competition, we could not cope with it. And we have said 
we have uh, closed our operation in Shanghai. That was about uh, 15 years ago. So today, I would like to see how under the current economic situation and pandemic challenges that Ben and David, both of them, can keep on growing overseas. How to overcome challenges in acquisition process of overseas practices and how to manage the office overseas. I'm sure our member here will love to know that because I think like uh, earlier, uh, we have a preliminary, di preliminary discussion that I think what David mentioned that our market here is very small, it's limited. We only have like 30, 36 million population here, but the world has almost 8 billion population where actually the market is bigger and wider. I hope that we can also hear more on how architect can work hand in hand, join forces and share resources to undertake international projects. And I hope this will motivate our members here to try and look for opportunity overseas rather than restricting ourselves on local market. As we know today that uh, some of the uh, tech company and also architect, they work together uh, to offer virtual architecture service. I just uh, discovered that uh, one of uh, the tech company now uh, offering a parametric design where actually you can um, download the application and you can design uh, your building uh, yourself. Uh, you, can, uh, you can input all the, the data, how many rooms that you want, what kind of room, what are the size of building, how many story, then the system will design it for you. After you're satisfied with the system, with the design, then the architect will prepare the document for um, submission for approval for you. So this is how a tech company actually work in collaboration with machine, uh, with architect and machine uh, to produce drawing. So there is no limitation in collaboration. So today we want to hear, we used to to discuss about Malaysian architect collaboration. Today, we want to hear how architects, local architect, international architect co co uh, collaborate in delivering the work. And in future, we probably want to explore how architect can collaborate with artificial intelligence, with machine uh, to deliver wider uh, scope of work uh, to their clients. And I hope that uh, the with the sharing today, it will encourage our members uh, to explore more in the international market and not just in terms of uh, um, exploring more, not just in terms of collaboration with uh, architects, but also with other technologies, including the engineers, designers, or building technologies. With the presence of artificial intelligence today, there are a lot more opportunities uh, open uh, for us to explore to explore and to all participants today please stay to the end and enjoy the discussion with our speakers today so thank you very much jeff uh, back to you continue okay. with the session thank you, Dato. thank you our first speaker is architect david Mizan hashim group founder president and director of veritas design group established in 1987 a multidisciplinary firm which now has offices in nine countries. So David really doesn't need further introduction, so I won't go about doing much of that. Over to you, uh, David. Uh, David, please uh, unmute. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you, uh, Dr. Uzumi, for that kind introduction. Um, the topic today is collaboration. Um, and it's a very exciting topic for me. Uh, collaboration is absolutely essential to all the success that we've had. Um, Regretfully, much of that collaboration is not among uh, Malaysian design practices together, uh, especially in regard to um, working overseas. Um, the collaboration success that we've had 
is mostly to do with collaborating with Malaysian developers, uh, Malaysian suppliers, or collaboration with uh, foreign uh, partners and foreign um, uh, architects in different countries. So I think the, the, the story that I will tell today is a story of success in terms of exporting of professional services outside Malaysia. But I think more can be done in terms of collaboration amongst ourselves. So the first part of my presentation today will be about how we did it, how we went about it, and some of our success uh, around the world. And then maybe later on, we'll talk more about the theory or the practice and the strategies that uh, brought us to where we are. So I'll try to get this all done within about half an hour. Uh, it's a lot of slides, but I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, let's get going. So uh, this is what the talk is about, the export of professional services and how we've gone about that. So, you know, you can see in, uh, in this first uh, image, this is sort of the ethos of Veritas. Um, you know, we, we've always imagined ourselves not as a Malaysian company, but as a global practice, a global firm with multiple locations, but very proud to call Malaysia our home. That has been the ethos. It's not, we're not a Malaysian company with foreign offices. That's not how we think of ourselves. From the day one, we think of ourselves as a global company uh, with multiple um, places to be. Uh, currently, we have nine international offices. Uh, our most recent office was in Jakarta, which we opened uh, in February this year. Before that was Tokyo, which was in uh, I think November last year, and uh, along with other offices around the world. The one place where we've closed an office is in Saudi Arabia. We closed that uh, a couple of years ago. We still have a registered entity there, but it is no longer, uh, there's nobody there. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll, when things pick up, we will also be back there. So we have currently, this is our global uh, footprint. And of course, we have our offices uh, in Malaysia as well. Um, you know, being, being a, quite a large organization um, is part of uh, the ability to uh, export services. Um, often, if you're, if, you're, if you're too small, and I'll go into that in more detail later, a lot of international uh, potential clients, when they know that you're a 20 person firm or a 30 person firm, they might not give you the kind of, uh, that might not give the confidence that you need. And so fortunately, because we were able to grow to a certain size, we, we reached a tipping point where suddenly we are considered to be a global player amongst the other big, uh, you know, multi multidisciplinary firms in the world. So we have uh, completed projects in 17 countries and another, uh, another 17 countries where we've done work but not completed. So this is um, uh, how we uh, exist today. Uh, we are within the top 100 worldwide and in ASEAN, according to BCI Asia, we are in the uh, top 10 within ASEAN. And this is important again, in terms of being able to find collaborators and partners. Uh, because when you get to a certain strength and you have a strong brand, people want to join you. People want to collaborate with you. And that's part of the secret um, to our opening many offices internationally is when people, foreign architects, foreign companies want to join uh, and be part of our network. So I think you know uh, me and you think, I think many of you on this phone call on this, uh, on this uh, conference will know my partner Lillian Tay. But you know, Veritas is actually a very deep organization with uh, many principles around the world and within various disciplines and offices in Kuala Lumpur. So for example, I'm, I'm just going to talk about who the partners are uh, because this is what makes us work globally. Uh, you know, so CK, CK is the principle of Veritas Architects in Singapore, which is a registered practice. A, a little bit of a story about that. When we registered Veritas Architects in Singapore, the Board of Architects of Singapore was very, very against it. They were very unhappy about that. Uh, they, you know, they were uh, they were asking why does a Malaysian firm need to register in Singapore? You know, it was a very 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 protectionist. It took us almost two years to finally uh, get this to be approved. Um, uh, so you know, it's interesting how countries are very very protective. I guess how Malaysia is also protective. Imagine if uh, you know Norman Foster wanted to open Norman Foster Architect in Malaysia. How much resistance there would be to that? But we finally managed to get it through. And the work of Veritas Singapore is now part of our uh, portfolio. Veritas Indonesia and under Andrew is one of our recent additions. 
like Singapore, this was an existing practice. Uh, Veritas Singapore is a 30 year old firm which has been rebranded under Veritas. And Veritas Indonesia is about a 12 year old firm which has now been rebranded and re-registered. Uh, under, under Veritas. And this is part of how we have managed to grow our international operations through uh, acquisition, mergers, and uh, rebranding of international practices that want to be part of the, uh, the Veritas experience. Uh, uh, Vietnam is one of our fastest growing offices, and we'll hear more about Vietnam probably from uh, Ben, one of the other speakers today, who's got a very successful uh, operations uh, there. Christian has been running Vietnam for about uh, 10 years now. Uh, in India, <clears throat> uh, uh, Mahendra used to be based in uh, Mumbai. We've recently moved to Delhi. This is one of our projects that we completed. Uh, Hisaya Sugiyama, interesting, who went to university with me at Harvard uh, <clears throat> and then went on to work for some of the biggest projects in the world, including um, Ropongi Hills, you see here in this picture, is now part, has re-registered his company as, uh, as Veritas and is now operating uh, out of Tokyo. Uh, in Melbourne, uh, Anton Allers, who is also our medical uh, planning and architect uh, expert, um, runs our team out of uh, Melbourne. Uh, in London, Peter, shown here with a project for Brunel University, one of our uh, bigger clients in the UK. Uh, Richard out of uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, a town that I know very well with family uh, from there runs our office in USA, which is growing uh, quite a lot in the last two years. So this is how we Veritas is organized. You know, we have all these global offices um, and uh, these principals who run it. So these guys basically make all the decisions for those offices uh, such that, you know, headquarters doesn't need to get involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, details because it would be too difficult. Every country has its own regulations, its own uh, uh, laws for human resources, its own taxation regulations. It's impossible for any center like Kuala Lumpur to be able to manage that. So these are all very independent uh, companies, which Veritas um, holds the branding rights and holds the naming rights and does uh, projects together in collaboration. So the collaboration that we talk about is where headquarters in Kuala Lumpur collaborates with all these internationally registered brands. So these are not uh, local local architect partners. No, these are registered Veritas entities. Um, and that gives us the credibility when we meet with clients that uh, that we're not just making a casual, uh, you know, joint venture. This is these aren't joint ventures. These are serious uh, uh, registered entities, which uh, Malaysia has a stake in with completed projects in about 17 countries, the list on the left and uh, on the right projects where we have done work but have yet not completed anything, hopefully in the next few years. In terms of how we operate, each of these uh, international offices has a certain, I would say, uh, uh, zone of influence. Like for example, we, we tell our US office that they can do anything they want in North and South America, you know, no issue. In the UK, uh, it happens to be that our partner who runs UK had a lot of experience in Africa before he joined us. So we say to him that London, you have all of Europe and you have all of Africa. Uh, the, the Delhi office can control the whole subcontinent. Tokyo, they're very busy in Japan, but they also can uh, do parts of uh, the Northeast of Asia. Whereas Melbourne can do Australasia. Uh, Jakarta can handle, you know, and Ho Chi Minh's office can do all of um, uh, Indochina. So that's kind of how we manage some degree of control. Uh, occasionally, there is some conflict when, you know, the Delhi office wants to do a project in the UK or the US office wants to do a project in Asia. And I have, that's one of the things I have to manage is dealing with this, um, you know, when we start to rub up against each other and, uh, and, and everyone wants a piece of the pie. So this is one of the challenges of a global practice, controlling how your partners uh, interact with each other. And this is sort of how we operate. You know, the red is the Malaysia office and um, the, uh, the other offices you see around, they, they interact with each other. They work with each other. Uh, communications don't have to go through KL. In fact, we cannot manage all of the uh, interactions that happen. So all we can say is that, please go ahead and work with each other. Um, you can work with Kuala Lumpur if you need to, but otherwise, you know, proceed to, partner with whoever you want. 
And of all the international offices, a few of them are very small. For example, London and Melbourne are, are very small and the US. So what we do in those cases, there's another level of collaboration. If bigger projects come along, we work with bigger firms in London, one called Patel Taylor in Portland, which is BPA and another one in Melbourne called MGS. So uh, if a bigger project comes along and our small teams can't handle it, the collaboration goes to a different level. So I'm gonna show you some of the projects we've done in about 17 countries uh, and some of the projects we haven't completed yet. So in our Melbourne office, we do a range of uh, smaller scale projects like on the right, which is a historic conservation as well as medical care and retirement projects like on the left uh, in, in, in uh, the Copthorne uh, complex in Melbourne. In Bangladesh, we've uh, completed, <clears throat> completed um, a project on the left for the British government, uh, part of the uh, British High Commission. And we have uh, office towers under construction in Dhaka. Uh, in Brunei, we're doing work for the royal family. This is one of the big palaces that's under construction. Our services on this are interior design services, not architecture. So don't blame me for that picture in the upper right. It's not me, <laughs> but uh, we're the interior designer. Unfortunately, the loose furniture hasn't come in yet on this. Uh, in China, uh, when we merged with Veritas Singapore, Veritas Singapore in its previous existence have done many projects in China, like uh, uh, Shangri-La Hotel in uh, Hainan Island, in Lhasa, in Diking. So these are some of the projects which are now part of our portfolio, together with work uh, on transportation and embassy projects. So we used to have a very big footprint in China, even though we never had never had an office uh, there. Like you heard earlier from Izumi, it's a very difficult and very competitive country now. 20, 30 years ago, we were uh, we were seen as a, you know a top presence there. But today, Chinese firms are really amazing, quite amazing, and hard to compete with. Uh, in India, one of our fastest growing offices, uh, you see on the left here, a uh, project outside Hyderabad, 1,000 uh, over units of residences, and currently uh, on the right, projects uh, in Delhi for MR, which is a developer from, uh, from Dubai. Indonesia, we were one of the winners for the uh, new master plan for Nusantara, the capital of uh, Indonesia and Kalimantan. We continue to be involved in that, as well as other shopping malls and uh, commercial projects. Uh, Iran, very interesting country to, uh, to work in. Um, our PARS exchange is under construction. However, I would say it's been under construction for about eight years. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever be finished with the sanctions that are going on. So you see an image of it here on the left and other projects that we hope to happen in the future on the right. Um, in Japan, uh, now that we have uh, merged with Veritas uh, Japan, this is one of their most beautiful projects, which is a low energy development in Hokkaido. Uh, in the north. Um, one of the places I love uh, to go to do, to do work, uh, you know, because after work, you tend to spend a few more days uh, doing scuba diving. Uh, this is the Fairmont Hotel in, uh, in Maldives, uh, another fun place to do work. And, we, and the, you know, talking about Malaysians going overseas, this is one of those places where whenever we go there and meet people, they just love to meet Malaysians because most of the educated people in Maldives studied in, in Malaysia and spent some time in, you know, uh, tailors or, or Sunway or help, and, and they love meeting us. So we're very welcome uh, in the Maldives. Um, this is a project in Pakistan, um, a beautiful uh, clubhouse we completed many years ago, uh, golf and country uh, clubhouse in Lahore. Uh, working in the Middle East, uh, another very challenging location. Uh, but this is a, an example of collaboration because we did this project uh, for a Malaysian builder um, called Muhiba, which is one of the big Malaysian uh, construction companies who brought, they got the job on a design build basis and they brought us in. And so we're the proud uh, designer uh, and architect of this uh, very large in-flight catering facility at the new airport in Qatar. That's all about collaboration. In fact, all the engineers, all the landscape art, every consultant on this was from Malaysia. Uh, in Singapore, of course, the iconic Shangri-La Hotel is now part of our portfolio as a result of Singapore merging with uh, Veritas here in Malaysia, including all this, in fact, most of the Shangri-La hotels in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, Sri Lanka, a wonderful place to do business, um, not very far from KL. One of the ways we decide where to expand and do work is where, which locations are one flight away. And uh, uh, Colombo Airport used to be one flight away. Now it's not so easy to get there, but I think things will open up. And this is a nice 
a private home that we did on the beach. Uh, Dubai, where we, we used to have a very big office, um, but after the crash, we pulled out. Um, all of these projects here are collaborations with local uh, UAE-based uh, uh, engineers and architects. These are towers in Business Bay and other places in, in Dubai. In London, uh, our office uh, has been, for many years, working with one particular client, which is Brunel, uh, which is an engineering university to the west of the city. And uh, many of the buildings in the top left were designed by our UK office, uh, with the current project being the engineering school in the bottom right. In USA, uh, our, our small office is growing. Uh, on the left are some interiors and some small residential. And currently, about to start construction will be the net zero uh, project you see on the right. Uh, will be our first carbon neutral development in Portland, Oregon. Uh, in Vietnam, where we have quite a large team, about 15 people, I think, um, the work completed till to date is mostly landscape and interiors, but we have some major uh, architectural projects under construction now. In addition to uh, those projects completed, we have a lot of proposals around the world. Uh, Cambodia, I think, is one of those countries which is going to see a lot of growth in the next few years. We've done a little bit of work in, uh, for the Lion Group in Cambodia. This is a mall. Uh, we were involved in the interior design. In Egypt, uh, we were involved in the, uh, the competition for the museum, which we lost. And that's one of the things that I need to mention is that uh, one of the ways to get into the export uh, business is to uh, do international competitions, like this one as well for the Guggenheim, which we were shortlisted but didn't get uh, far. Uh, in Iraq, where I'm glad not to do any business, uh, I don't think my wife would allow me to go there nowadays. Uh, it's a dangerous place to work. But at one point before the, uh, the war, it was uh, a booming economy. Uh, another uh, country close to us is Laos, which I think will also be a great place to expand one day. Uh, places where, the, and again, before the war, uh, this is in fact uh, an airport at Gaddafi's home city of Sirt, which uh, never got off the ground. Uh, Myanmar, another uh, place which uh, obviously is going to be uh, on hold for many, many years, we think, uh, but eventually will be a place to uh, spread our wings. Uh, Nepal, a lovely place. Uh, people there are just wonderful and they, they love Malaysians. This is a, uh, a hotel, a holiday inn, which is under construction now, but unfortunately they chose a different design. Uh, Oman, this is a, a, a campus for a university. In the Philippines, another place which is uh, challenging. You know, the problem is that Malaysia has been an easy place to do business over the years, and it's so very comfortable and very safe. But you, you, you cannot be safe forever. You've got to take some risks, and some countries are safer than others. The Philippines uh, is a difficult place and a, and a very uh, risky place to do business, if you ask my opinion. Uh, Saudi Arabia, we might uh, open up there again. This is a resort in the new city of Neom. Uh, this uh, resort city on, on, the, on, the, on the coast. Sudan, you know, these are some countries which are going through some uh, terrible economic situation, but at one point uh, they were all uh, going through a boom. So you have to go where the, uh, where the money calls, where the opportunities uh, are. And uh, as far away as Africa in this particular project. And even Yemen. So, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't go to these places today, but we've worked there in the past. So, you know, if somebody asked me, how did we get here? I would say that um, it comes from my personal experience, you know, who I am, that's how it starts. My, my personal ethnic uh, identity is, which is rather complicated and rather uh, um, diverse. And that's where it starts and how I embed that diversity into the corporate identity, you know, how I am not, uh, uh, or I am adventurous, I'm, I'm, you know, want to travel the world. And I, I think of myself as a global citizen. Embedding that diversity and sense of adventure into the company. And then the company has that DNA and then developing strategies for that, uh, that, that, that practice of exporting services. And then eventually tying the brand and building the brand to become an international brand. And, and it's no accident that the name Veritas is a international name. It doesn't sound Malaysian. It's not American or English, it's, it happens to be Latin, uh, but it gives a ethos or sense of a global um, identity. So this is me, right? And if you just look at my uh, extended family, 
there are at least six different nationalities here and about four or five different religions with about eight different languages spoken. And that's me. I am not anything. It's, yes, I'm Malaysian, but I'm also many, many other things. And embedding that personality, identity into the company is what I've always been about. So if you walk through our office, you'll see people from all over the world. We are a mini multi, uh, mini United Nations. Um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, of course, in the last two years, because of uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, we are less international than we used to be, but we intend to grow that back to be as uh, diverse and uh, as, as possible. So if you walk into our office, you will see uh, things like this, you know, where, you know, where we celebrate where people are from, uh, where, you know, we even have one lady from the Caribbean, South America, from Colombia. You know, this is what we celebrate and we celebrate it in many different ways. We celebrate it in our, uh, the stated goals of the company. You'll notice it's the word, the word global or international or worldwide or planetary is found in all of our media. So our goal is to be a premier architectural and design for worldwide, not just Asia-wide or Malaysia-wide. And uh, so that's very much, and you'll see maps of the world in all of our material. We even have a company called Veritas Global, Sendiri Amberhat. And we started this off very, very long ago. Back in the 1990s, I uh, engaged a, a, an architect called Graham Atlin, and we launched Veritas International. Uh, it was a separate Sendiri and Burhad to grow the international business. And we created brochures, we, we did all kinds of marketing. And uh, as a result of that, managed to get some fairly large uh, projects overseas. So that's how it all began. So this was a brochure that we published in like 19, maybe 1991, 92, which uh, featured uh, some aspirational work. Most of these projects are actually in Malaysia, but here we are trying to present ourselves as a global company, even though we weren't. We were maybe like you know 20 people, 30 people, but we were already pretending that we were a, a big global entity. Uh, but you know, as they say, what you dream of, what you believe in, can eventually become reality. Even in all of our corporate uh, material, you can see that we had this uh, theme in 20, 2008 to 2009 called Go Go Global. This was our mantra. This was in everything that we did. And since 2010, our new mantra is ideas for the world. Again, the word, the international presence, world, planet, international, global is in all the uh, wordings of our uh, company. And the badges that we all wear uh, uh, in the office, it reminds people of this global uh, position that we try to be. And whenever we even have office parties, um, everything is about being global. So for example, we had a party a few years ago where the theme was you had to dress up in either Asian, European, American, or whatever, and we celebrate uh, our global identity. Even when you walk around our office, you'll see clocks showing the different times of our different offices, maps of the world. And um, whenever we work in countries, um, like for example, the US, the team that supports our US office, they have time zone adjusted working hours. The team that support our work in, um, in the India also have time adjusted working hours because of you know, the different time zones. So we have to give some flexibility uh, for the company to work across the 24 hour uh, time frame. I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call the chameleon paradox, which is, uh, you know, when people ask, how, do you, are, how are you able to, you know, work in these different uh, cultural environments? And the answer is uh, to be a chameleon, okay? Um, now you can think of being a chameleon as being negative, uh, but I like to turn it around saying it's being, a, it's being positive. It's about having many personalities, continuously adapting to different environments while maintaining your self's core identity. So for example, when I travel on business, when I go to different countries of the world, I need to adapt. I don't pretend to you know, um, be one thing. For example, when in China, I, I will eat anything. I will go to my clients' the parties and I will sit with them and I will uh, you know, make them feel that I understand their culture. When I'm in Cambodia, I'll be going out to the bars and drinking with them because that's what you do uh, in, in business. In India, you go and eat uh, the, the best um, biryani uh, and it tell you it's really bad for your stomach. But if you can survive it, you'll build bonds. When you're in Vietnam, you need to party. If you don't party, they won't trust you. In Dubai or in Iran, you need to be pious. So you can, you can, you can put on that uh, hat and you can play that role as well. So this is what I do. 
And this is what the leaders of Veritas are able to do. And it's because of this that we're able to succeed in all the countries we work in. So if you're not able to adapt in this way, you're not gonna stand much chance of, uh, 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 of being successful in many different environments, maybe only one or maybe only two. The other thing I want to mention is about cross-cultural uh, merging. You know, uh, the world is getting so integrated and what used to be East or West is now no longer so clearly East or West. Whether it is uh, fashion, uh, East and West is merging, whether it's music, whether it's uh, anything, telecommunications, technology, art, and of course, architecture. The East and the West have merged. And this is an incredible opportunity for us Malaysian architects to uh, expand beyond our borders because we understand how different cultures have come together because we are not one culture. We are a multicultural country. So we have used this to our advantage, this understanding of how to how to be sensitive about culture. So for example, and I, and I, and I urge you to read this book. It's about um, the clash of civilizations and how, how about the world uh, in the future will either be at war or will we be at peace and will only be at peace if we're able to understand and accept and respect each other's uh, cultures and able to adopt some aspects of them. So for example, when we do work in Iran, we don't try to impose Western or Malaysian cultural inferences. We try to understand their local uh, uh, cultural challenges and integrate them into modern design. So you can see where we get some of our inspiration from when we do projects. This one is in, uh, in uh, Tehran. And when we work in Dubai, some of the work that we do isn't so modern. It actually uh, interprets local cultural heritage into our work. This is a shopping center in, uh, in Bur, Dubai. And so we, we bring modern planning, modern uh, technology, but sometimes it is clad uh, in a more traditional uh, facade. Or in this project in Yemen, you can see though, although this uh, Hyatt Hotel is a very modern uh, planning design, it is inspired by some of the elements of, this is uh, uh, historic buildings in uh, Sana'a, uh, where we went to visit. So, you know, you can see where the uh, elements are derived from. So bringing these uh, cultural elements together, Malaysian architects are very good at this because that's what we were taught. Uh, you know, in our professional lives here in Malaysia. In this uh, embassy in, in uh, Beijing, we brought elements together of the Istana architectural typology together with Forbidden City to merge it into a, the single uh, new form, which is uh, um, institutional, yet at the same time welcoming. Uh, in this uh, train series of train stations in Beijing for the Olympics, we were inspired by uh, Chinese um, uh, writing, as well as the form of the Olympics, which were held that year to, to inspire the form. So, so this is, uh, and here in Maldives, the, project, the Fairmont project, which I showed you, the clients are very um, uh, open to ideas when you make references to their local culture. And this is a, this is a, a plant, a tree that is their local um, national tree. And we said, we're, the plan of this project is gonna be derived and inspired by the local fauna. And so this is where we really uh, are able to uh, impress the local uh, clients. Or in this project in Iran, uh, this is a museum uh, where we uh, take poetry from a famous Persian uh, uh, poet and embed it into the facade of this uh, translucent uh, element. This is talking about merging of, uh, of cultures. And in Vietnam, this convention center inspired by the lotus, which is the uh, traditional flower of, uh, of Vietnam. And another project in Vietnam, an office building, and you can see how the, uh, uh, the, the concept for this project was derived. And when you show this to a client, a Vietnamese client who, who, who respects their own traditions and culture and sees that foreigners will also understand, they really appreciate it. The project in Egypt inspired by the sand dunes or this project in Dubai, inspired by uh, traditional uh, Islamic uh, uh, geometries. So this is, this is how, you know, when you export services, you look at what they have and the cultures they have and the traditions, and you merge it with what you know, and then you will have uh, success. Uh, I'll skip this project because it's a bit long to explain. Um, we often uh, are inspired by elements of the oasis when we do projects in Dubai, oasis in the sky, and another project in Qatar, which is inspired by the sand dunes again, 
uh, which is completed now. Or projects which are inspired by local cultural traditions and crafts like weaving in this building in Bangladesh. In some countries, you need to understand um, some very unique things. For example, in India, you need to understand something called Vashtu. If you don't understand Vashtu, don't even try to do business in India. And so you'll see these uh, different uh, positions in, a, in the, uh, in the uh, north, south, north, south, east, west. And if you don't understand that, you can't do business in, in India. So as I, as I wrap up here, uh, I'm just going to end by saying that if you want to do work overseas and if you want to collaborate, this is the way that I propose, this is the experience that I've gone through, and uh, hopefully it is a, a map for others to follow. First of all, you need to commence export, of, uh, you need to think about exporting services when you are strong. I know a number of companies that have started to do work overseas because they're desperate. They're, they, they, you know, they've run out of work. That is the uh, formula for failure. Uh, because you will make the wrong decisions when you're in the corner. You must only begin doing this when you are in a strong place and the rest of your business in, uh, in Malaysia is strong. Then you can start. And start with identifying local business partners to collaborate with. Um, these are Malaysian companies that are beginning to go overseas, that you know them from work that you've done for them here in Malaysia or they know of you. That is the way that we started, through collaboration. Right? That is the key element here that I'm trying to, uh, to, 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 to explain. And if necessary, go with other partners. That's not, going with other local architects has not been our experience so far, but we may be doing that uh, uh, in the future. The second one, ensure that all your stakeholders, meaning your partners in your practice, meaning your staff, your employees are committed, making sure that they understand what you're going to do and identify the right individuals in the company to lead this effort. For example, if you have some very uh, conservative uh, uh, staff and you want to send them to Cambodia or Laos, uh, maybe you should think again, because that's not the kind of culture that they will feel comfortable in. Maybe they'll feel more comfortable in Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, so think about who you're going to send. And the best people are those who, have, who think of themselves as global citizens, you know, not Malayu, not China, not India, not anything. They, they can be anything anywhere. That's the best people to, to lead your efforts. Uh, identify foreign collaborators, because in many countries where we don't have an office, we need to find the local uh, architect to collaborate with, who submits our plans and does all that work. And they must share your values and culture. If you're choosing somebody, somebody just because of, you know, they were introduced to you or just because they're cheap, uh, again, uh, projects take a long time to complete, right? We all know that. Uh, it's not a good way to start. Number five, I would in encourage all of the you know, people on this uh, conference, respond to any invitation, anything you get, you get an invitation from you know, Mongolia, take it, but don't invest in it. Make sure the client pays for it. But if you're going to invest in something or take a risk, only invest in the most promising places. Look at the countries which are growing. Look at the countries which are nearby. Look at the countries where you have an opportunity, where the local um, professional, uh, the quality of the prof professionals are not as strong. Those you should invest in. Again, number six, be ready for very different expectations of services and fees. Things are very different overseas. You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked, uh, you know, at how low or how high uh, fees can be. Um, but things are very different. Even the word, uh, you know, the word concept stage or schematic design means different things in different countries. Don't assume it means what you think. And you can get yourself into deep trouble um, and, and in fact, legal difficulties if you misinterpret uh, language. Number seven, wherever you go, like I've showed in my presentation, learn about the local culture, traditions and customs. Because if you do, the, local, the, the clients will really uh, value you. They'll value you. They don't want just a foreign architect to come and tell them what to do. They want them to respect and learn about their local uh, customs. And number eight, when you've achieved some success, that's when don't just sit on your ass, but start to hire expats, you know, build up uh, the internal abilities like we have done. Um, you know, some, from some countries are not very expensive, of course, from the US and UK, they can be very expensive. But hiring expats from the Philippines, Indonesia, 
Thailand, bring them into your organization and make your company seem more uh, global. Then you can gradually build up your identity. And eventually when you can get to the end point, brand yourself as not just another Malaysian company, you know, with, the, with uh, you know, a lot of Malaysian firms uh, and their firm with A-R-K-I-T-E-K, -E that brands yourself as a Malaysian company. And, and I suggest that if you could just use a more global uh, uh, naming, you have a more chance to be accepted wherever you go. And with that, I think I would just end with, uh, you know, let's do it guys. And I'm open to more collaborations. We have big projects. Hopefully we'll be involved in the development phases of Nusantara. And if so, we're going to be inviting many, many Malaysian firms to come with us. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Jeffrey. Oh, great. Uh, what, what a great insight that you've uh, given all of us. Actually, the 10 key points that you presented in the last slide, that is something that everyone should have. You know, take a screenshot and uh, you know, keep it as a guide. So thanks very much, uh, David. That's really a valuable uh, sharing. So next, uh, we have uh, architect Ben Yeo. He's the founder and president of BYG Group, um, an architectural practice which he set up in uh, Penang in 1994. But it has grown to have offices in uh, China, Vietnam, and Thailand. And not only does BYG provide uh, architectural services, but they are also into turnkey solutions. So these are among, there are many services and for more details, I'd let, uh, Ben uh, elaborate. So over to you, Ben. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right. Um, I'll kick off uh, by sharing my screen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right. I'll I'll take you through a step by step um, uh, history of how um, I founded the business of BYG like twenty eight years ago. All right. Um, it has, un, has not been a, a, a simple journey, but a very interesting one. Um, okay, we, we started in Penang, 1994. Um, and to date, we have offices, uh, two in Malaysia, uh, one in China, one in Vietnam, and we opened Thailand up about a year ago. Um, of course, all of us are architects. That's where we, we started off as a, as a licensed architectural firm. Small, started five people sole proprietor, but since then we corporatize. And where we don't have offices, we, uh, we operate from Malaysia, all right? And with projects in Singapore, India, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia. Uh, so we operate from, from, from Penang, all right? Where we, where we don't have an office to springboard on. And believe it or not, like um, 20 odd years ago, uh, clients that we have in Penang, say that let's go to low cost sites and China 20 years ago was considered a low cost site. Uh, first project, easy, you know, we got paid in Malaysia. Subsequent projects, clients uh, got established the entities there. Then they start saying, uh, we cannot pay you ringgit anymore or US dollar, we have to pay you renminbi. So that's where we started incorporating wholly foreign owned enterprises. And ever since then, we have an entity in Shanghai and within in an office in Shanghai, we could actually do uh, projects all over China, uh, the, the greater China itself. Similarly in Vietnam, all right, uh, had a, another opportunity, clients, uh, multinational companies who are based in the Silicon Valley of Penang, um, decided that we want to build a semiconductor plant in, in, in Vietnam, all right, uh, let's do a competition. So we, with competitions with global firms uh, we won and we built a semiconductor plant there. First factory was okay. Subsequent, then they said, all right, future projects, please get yourself established there. So that's how we operate uh, with uh, clients intending to go uh, offshore with us. And similarly, the same formula happened in Thailand. So that happened uh, last year. And along the way, clients got a bit impatient saying that, all right, you do the design, you do the budgeting, you do the scheduling, we don't have time, we need to break ground yesterday. So why don't you become the contractor? You guarantee the budget, you guarantee the schedule, you become the contractor. So that's where we started registering with the uh, CIDB, 
we got small licenses of limit 1 million, 10 million. And eventually with subsequent projects, we now have a G7 license uh, capable of uh, doing large projects um, you know, with no limit in terms of scale. All right, so on a selective basis, uh, we do collaborate with uh, not only designers, engineers, subcontractor suppliers, that's where we become turnkey design and build contractors as well. <clears throat> and having practice, uh, you know, regionally, as well as uh, in our own backyard in Malaysia, um, uh, we also get approached to do town planning, urban planning. So this is part of our, port our portfolio of scope as well. So in, in the Northern region, we are one of the largest town planning business. And uh, so we not only do it within uh, Malaysia, but also regionally uh, where develop, real estate developers do approaches for our, our services. And apart from um, uh, architecture, construction, engineering type of uh, businesses along the way, uh, we've incorporated other businesses that goes into property development, uh, facilities development, as well as uh, uh, build and lease. So these are some of the, the type of businesses that, believe it or not, started off as an architectural firm. That's where we could think that uh, in terms of uh, the unlimited boundaries of business that you could go into, uh, that's where you can think if you're a young architect or a young firm coming in, um, there are no boundaries. But most important of all, you must learn how to collaborate and be fair to uh, your partners. Now, so, well, the theme of uh, today's webinar is, um, you know, collaboration and export. All right. So keyword export. So why not? You know, like David mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Malaysia is small. But with the opportunity, with a mindset, you know, if you do good work, you know, the play field can be limitless, no boundaries, so it can go global. But obviously, it's the price to pay. There are high risks, but obviously, the returns are high. So, but, so what, what, what's important about it is perseverance and the appetite, um, you know, to pick yourself up when you fall. And, um, you know, the, the, the human nature is such that, when you're successful, everybody wants to celebrate with you. But when you have failures, you cry alone. So be mindful that uh, there are pains and there are joy, but the risks are high, but the returns are there. But what, what makes you more resilient is your lessons learned with every project, with every relationship you establish with a, 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 a person or a firm that you collaborate. But along the way in the journey, you, you build a wealth of experience and credibility. Uh, with this credibility, uh, you gain respect and uh, no amount of marketing will help you. Uh, it's with this credibility that potential clients will reach out to you. And there will be nice surprises along the way. Like, so the, 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 the thing that you need to also organize in your head is what can you offer uh, beyond your normal architectural services? And uh, not just about design, but think in terms of market segments that you can go into. Uh, one of our key strengths is in the industrial sector. We are very fortunate because Penang in the north of Malaysia has always been uh, you know, uh, uh, known as the Silicon Valley of the East. So we have a 40, 50, 40 plus years of, of, of reputation here as the hotbed of uh, high-tech industries. So this is where uh, part of my, uh, my, my education in, in architectural come industrial uh, skills came into doing industrial buildings. But we are also uh, heavily involved in residential. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the audience that we have today, you know, this is one of the very fundamental type of projects you get involved in residential, right? And then there will also come with the real estate market, obviously the, the commercial malls, the, the hotels and things like that. And obviously the resorts, the tourism related development will be another segment we'll look into, all right? Um, and, and Georgetown Penang being a, uh, you know, a, a, a UNESCO heritage zone, 
we have the opportunity to get involved in conservation type of project as well. And, and obviously, as we mentioned, as I just mentioned just now, uh, town and urban planning is also another opportunity that you could look into. So if you look in terms, in terms of uh, the type of work that you can do and where your skill sets are, are more pronounced and more strong, and uh, this is where certain things that uh, certain clients may decide that, okay, industrial, some of them, which are very established in your home, uh, home base, may want to go and export. They will take you along. And similarly, with, with like residential clients and commercial clients. So this is where we've been very fortunate uh, to, to grow with our clients uh, beyond uh, the, the Malaysian side. And these are nice surprises, you know, in, in Vietnam, uh, did a little clubhouse, you know, um, even got a silver uh, PEM award, you know. Um, and with good work comes uh, good recognition, not only from your clients, but even in the, uh, the role, uh, local real estate community, right? So you get property awards, the clients are happy. They're very proud of their successful development. And it's very the start of you getting repeated business. So key is that be passionate about what you do and um, do good work and get the repeated business and get recognition. Um, you know, practice the same as Malaysia. You don't get to advertise. The best, the best advertisement is through word of mouth. People will reach out to you. Now, so the, the fundamental question is, so why collaborate? Ask yourself, why not? Well, I think your, everyone is human. We cannot do everything ourselves. But collaboration means also sharing risks. Um, things you do not know, they are unknowns. You feel uncomfortable. When you feel uncomfortable, there's a risk. There's a risk when you don't feel confident. So that's where you collaborate with, you know, by default, as an architect, you will have to collaborate with uh, sub-consultants like engineers, people who do permitting for you, other architects, project managers, construction managers, QS, even lawyers and accountants, and a whole host of you know, other uh, individuals or companies that put together become a theme that's where you will have success in the, in the project you're working on. And with this collaboration of, um, of, of relationships you, you establish, you know, you learn new things. You know, one of the things that I, I always keep in my, in my head together with my um, associates or even my employees is that, you know, you learn new things that you never, never go to a place and say that we never do this in Malaysia. No, you go in there and learn new things and you'll be surprised that a lot of um, things that we learn overseas, we wish you had done it in Malaysia. I'll, I'll share with you a, a bit in terms of simple, very fundamental things, you know, we wish we could have done it in Malaysia or our conditions of practice here are a bit different. And, and if you were to have a good collaboration and good partners, your partners will watch your back. You know, it's long distance. You know, although you may be a, a, a principal, a leader, you may travel and spend a lot of time on the plane in a hotel, but on the ground, to make sure the clients are happy, your partners have to be happy, and your partners need to be responsible to make sure that the project is, respons is, is successful. But I mean partners is not only your, your own firm, but your associates, you know, uh, that you collaborate with, that they, they watch out not only for themselves, but for the success of the project and for, for yourself. And, and just give you uh, some example, all right? Uh, these are two projects that's ongoing, all right? Uh, for example, in Thailand, you know, I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, this is a, a semiconductor project that we are doing up about 300 kilometers off uh, Bangkok. Um, Client wants a column-free uh, production area. And this is 75 meters, all right? And look how thin the spanning member is. And this member is not only supporting the roof, it's going to have a walkable ceiling, whereby a clean room is below where they can manufacture semiconductor capacitor and chips. And that walkable ceiling is very heavy, carrying in switchboards, piping, utilities, and all that. All right. 
And also in, in, in for example, in Thailand, it's virtually un unheard of that you have to import earth to do uh, backfilling to raise the building. Over here, all the slabs are elevated and supporting, supported on individual piles. And there's a gap below the floor. And it's something that we learn very fundamentally there is that, hey, these this, this engineers are very creative, but no, they, this is local engineers from Thai universities, all right? And typically the construction is by default, you know, a lot of contractors even do their own precasting within themselves. And they're, they're, the way of they're doing the structural steel in the construction is so different. This project's in Malaysia, all right? Um, this is a truss that only spans 30 meters versus 45, uh, 75 meters. And the depth of the truss for 30 meters is already three meters deep, all right? And the columns were built up by, by concrete because steel is too expensive. And, and the, 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 the way we, we approached the design was the structural engineers just by default saying that this is the best way to go. I say, wouldn't it be expensive? No, this is how do we do it locally over there. So learned a lot from, 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 uh, from our foreign partners, learned a lot from our foreign engineers. All right. And with that, we came back and told our local uh, partners that, hey, uh, it's very expensive right now to, to find hollow sections or even I-beams. What they do over there is steel plates, cut, form, welded, all by CNC machines. And it's cheaper over there. All they need to need one stock of uh, type of steel, steel plates. Whereas here, we have to weld hollow sections of different sizes and I-beams. So these are very fundamental um, differences that we take for granted that let's leave it to the engineers. But for me, when I collaborate, I really, really appreciate the type of experience that we, we work with, uh, with the, the local guys. So like I mentioned just now, even like engineers, the way we do permitting, um, with a large 1.2 million square feet building, you know, one of the things we, we will encounter in Malaysia is that our uniform building bylaws cannot comply because our 60 meter running distance is, it, it is, uh, it is, it exceeds the limit. So we have to go for performance-based fire engineering. All right. So, so that takes long time for permitting, but in Thailand, when they do automotive plants, uh, two to three million square feet a pop, um, their regulations there are so advanced. They've never heard of fire tunnels. And, and this is now learning that they are so progressive. Whereas in, in, in Malaysia, we have to work differently. Um, other things like materials, you know, for the last 30 years that I've practiced, you know, wherever there need, there's a need for firewalls, you know, fire rated drywalls is the way to go because they're lightweight, they can be taken down and they can be removed. But in Malaysia, Firewalls have to be in masonry, brick, blocks, you know, or, or, or precast concrete panels. So these are some of the key differences will open up your eyes. And if you were to impose our way of doing things here, when you go over to, let's say, Thailand or Vietnam or China, um, hold on a bit, listen to what the local partners can tell you, and you learn a lot of things, all right? And it's by, by, by having that sort of freedom, um, it's such a joy working with your collaborators there. Like I said, they watch your back, you listen, and it's an education experience, all right? So, so this is some of the sharings I can do with you, you know, um, simple. Um, <clears throat> and how do you do it, all right? I mean, David has shared 10, 10 bullet points just now. Uh, I don't have bullet points, but I can, sh I can verbalize in terms of uh, how to be successful and also how to approach it step-by-step. Step. Um, first thing is to understand the expectations. Understand your own expectations and also understand the expectations of your partners that you're gonna collaborate with. You know, 
everybody wants to be happy in a relationship, especially in a collaboration, because everybody's taking risks. So, um, so when you go at it together, make sure that the very human element of relationship is, 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 is well understood, all right? Now, I'll elaborate about that in, in the next uh, slides. Also, think about what are your niche capabilities that you can do that the local side in the other country uh, may not be able to do as good as you, or niche capabilities that your customer or your client thinks <clears throat> That, you, that he feels very comfortable working with you. So in our case, uh, we work with real estate developers on and off. I mean, very consistently, they tell them, ah, you're the best partner. Let's go and hold my hand. Let's go over there and do a site selection. Let's go and understand the regulations. Let's go and look for you know, land. Let's look and look for you know, uh, a lawyer or accountant, an architect or engineer to work with. So, so this is where you build relationships and, and try to understand the expectations of your, your customers, all right? And also like, for example, if you have a very, like for, us, for ourselves, we, we pride ourselves in terms of um, working on high technology projects. This is a niche capability. So when we go to uh, other sites, we do not have, for example, areas of uh, skills in semiconductor manufacturing or medical device manufacturing. This is where we, 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 we have a premium uh, of doing such work uh, in a, on a location where there's no such skill sets. And, and not only do you gain respect of the locals, but you also gain respect of the, of the government on the other side. You know, uh, we have the MIDA in Malaysia. I've many times accompanied my clients to the MIDA of the other side, which is like the, the Board of Investment of Thailand or the Ministry of, of, of Investment in, 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 in another country. So this is where you help promote as well as explain uh, challenges that the clients have and they need help from the, from the foreign government in terms of how to dovetail their, their, their incentives and, and their regulations to make our, our project work. Um, the other thing is to respect the local norms. I just showed you just now, just the local norms of engineering, structural engineering, that, that's one. And, and also the way of uh, local way of doing things, right? The way they do permits are different. The way um, 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 drafting of technical drawings are different, no choice, you know? Um, you may have to work on a relationship whereby you do 70% of the work, your local partner does 30% localization. And you, you make sure that uh, both of y'all uh, understand where, where the demarcation of scope is. Um, the other thing that you have looked at is uh, comply with local laws in two, 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 two sectors. Obviously, one of on top of your head, you'll be concerned about regulations of uh, construction. But that sort of thing, you leave it to your local partner to do all the permits. But the other one I'm more concerned is that doing a business in a foreign site, um, be mindful in terms of what can be done and what cannot be done. And that's where you have to engage with the uh, lawyers and accountants on the other side. Uh, for example, in China and Vietnam, it's okay to incorporate in a company there. You can start business, you can sign contracts, you can move forward, but you're not a licensed architect. Okay, then you hire a local uh, partner to do all the permits for you. But you also be careful, you know, because uh, the word architect and engineers are also um, protected. But along the way, you establish yourself you can also go and apply for licenses of, of, uh, to, to, to have the same capability. So even when you get a license, you have to think twice. Can you read or write Vietnamese? Can you sign, would you dare sign a plan in Vietnamese? No, you still use uh, local associates to actually uh, help support that, even though you're, you're given the recognition by the local government, all right? So comply with local laws, but you know, and you, you may have to be a bit careful in terms of the way of how you describe yourself. You know, so that's why uh, we are very careful in terms of, of uh, the way we brand and name our companies. And obviously, you know, to survive long term, you have to go for the long haul. Exporting services is not about hit and run. Uh, it's about having a long term uh, outlook of how you want to be sustainable 
uh, in, in a foreign site. Like, so just like, just give you an idea, you know, our, our strength, like 50% of our work is in high tech industrial work, you know, um, very strong in semiconductor, electronic manufacturing, medical healthcare, aerospace, this sort of uh, industries. But the other 50%, we are also quite busy working with, uh, you know, whatever that is in the real estate market that's available. Obviously, right now with the pandemic situation, uh, real estate market is down because you know people are buying less uh, houses all right but fortunately in the pandemic uh, uh, situation there's a shortage of computer chips because um, people are buying more toys buying more computers buying more cell phones so there is a big crunch in terms of uh, uh, under supply of semiconductor chips. So that's why the industrial market right now, a lot of multinationals are building their plants to actually catch up with the uh, shortfall of supply. And also with the trade war between the US and China, a lot of firms are writing, uh, uh, a lot of companies are bypassing China and coming over to the Southeast Asian side, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia. These are actually the beneficiaries of you know, a, a situation whereby we should actually look at uh, the trending of, 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 of uh, what was happening with the markets globally, all right? So, so, so also one of the things that gives you an edge is uh, do diversify, don't only do residential, try to be able to be strong in several segments of the, of the market, all right? <clears throat> so, this is where you start analyzing in terms of you deal with a multinational company, all right? Like it or not, you're Asian. So, so typically we, we will think in terms of two halves. Our customers will be multinational companies, be it European or American, or even go neutral international building code. So understand when you speak to your foreign customers, especially when they're doing a, a, a high-tech manufacturing facility, they will speak to you in their uh, um, technical jargon in what they are used to, right? But you have to be prepared to be able to translate in the regional codes, uh, the GB codes in China, the TV, TCVN in Vietnam, or even the Malaysian uh, UBBL. You see. So this is where it's not only about language, about culture, but also knowledge, right? Where it will help you trans trans uh, tremendously if you keep an open mind. And this is where your partners can help you. All right, to, to comprehend. So some of these projects, your collaborators may be already working with you in, in let's say in Malaysia, but with, the, with their help, will help to also educate or download to your partners in, in, in uh, the, your foreign place of practice. <clears throat> so this is how we operate, all right. Um, some clients only approach us to do design. All right, no project management, just design, or even a concept design or front end engineering or even a programming study. So, or for example, right, certain clients, they have their own project management uh, uh, in-house uh, team or some clients, especially Europeans, they prefer to have uh, independent uh, project management construction thing. So you only done with design or even Japanese turnkey contractors, they come to us, do the design, do the construction documents, do the permits, but no need supervision, they will handle it. You come in periodically, it's what you require by the regulation. So, so, but the bulk of our work, like most of us, we do design and project management, first one in, last one out, all right? First one in with the very first sketch, the piece plot, piece of land, the site plan and you do the conceptualizing, you do a 30%, 60%, 90% design until issue for construction. Babysit the, the contractors until the construction is complete. Go through the final accounts, go through the, your CCC, go through until the defects library period is out, you're the last one out, all right? So that's what we do, project management. And turnkey design and build is the other part where we do, it's quite fun when you become a contractor. and um, this is where we, we do things in parallel. We haven't decided where the doors are when we start piling, all right? So this is where it's fun, where you can do design parallel with construction. 
And, and one of the fun things is that uh, doing industrial work, um, a lot of uh, local uh, uh, councils are, are very friendly in terms of giving you early commencement of work and, and bypassing the uh, planning permission process because they are already in an industrial park. So, so this is another way in terms you can dovetail your project. Do you want to do design only? Or you want to do the whole design and the policeman work? Or you want to become a contractor? Yeah. So, so these are many ways you could actually slice and dice the business opportunities as an architect. Okay, <clears throat> so coming to the, 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 the tail end of my, my, my sharing is uh, how do you sustain success? So I got a bit long-winded. So I say, do good work. That's, that's important. That's, that's where no amount of, um, of, of flyers uh, blasting your, 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 your CV will help. You know, it, a, a successful project, you know, other developers will hear about it. They want to test you out and they will, I'm sure they'll reach out to you. All right. So this is where we find that if you do good work, win some awards, you know, and, and continuing making sure that you, you build up your client relationships and, and through referrals this is where uh, your exported services can be like self-sustaining. Right. Um, and the other thing is target repeated clients. No point you, you tire yourself in terms of, oh, I must go and get uh, 50 clients this year. No, have two or three clients that keep giving you repeated work. That, that, that helps you sustain, right, regionally. So you get repeated work for the same client, not only in Malaysia, but also regionally. So like some of the multinational clients that we work with, we were successful in, in, in Penang. Then they tested out us in China. In China, they had a couple of sites. And next thing you know, we were doing Thailand. You know, we were helping them on consultancy in, in, in Japan, Korea as well. So, so there's no limit in terms of once a, cl a client believes in you. All right? and, and leverage on the lessons learned. Not only keep it within yourselves, but download to your partners, your employees, your, your key uh, stakeholders as well. And, and they can help you grow the business. All right. And take the opportunity to grow with clients. All right. The one of the reasons why they want to go offshore is because they want to grow. So grow with them, you know. But the underlying success of uh, how you can be successful is uh, your partners that you collaborate with. <clears throat> Reciprocate with your partners all the good work and, uh, and uh, the, the good intent they give to you. I, to, be, to be honest, about half of my work overseas actually is, is actually brought in by my partners that I collaborate with. All right. So they, they like the way we are open hearted, we share, and, and it's okay. You know, to, to let, let your local partners take the lion's share of the, of the fees, the lion's share of the fees, right? But you can see that by doing that, you build confidence, you build positive uh, vibes that partners will come back, not only watch your back, they want to work with you repeatedly as well. So that's the other side of uh, good uh, marketing. Your partners will say good things about you. They'll bring um, more business for you. So these are, um, on the closing, these are some of the work that we've done. Uh, we've done conservation work. Um, we won awards for not only the conservation, but for the, the development of this mixed development that's wrapped around uh, 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 this 100-year-old uh, <coughs> um, building. All right, this is Gurney Paragon in Penang, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, shopping malls in uh, Gurney Drive. Uh, over on the mainland in Butterworth Prai, okay, we've also won an award for uh, Designer Village. This is a, uh, a, a outlet for all the brands uh, in a sprawling site in Batukawan. Um, also, uh, we rehabilitated a old uh, stadium and aquatic center and rebranded it as a convention center as well. So Wara, this was a competition with the uh, Majlis Bandaraya, Bandaraya Pulau Pinang, whereby we want, they wanted, the competition was for a convention center. And uh, what we did was, we did a 
we, we, we felt that um, there's not enough uh, park lands in the south of Penang Island in Bayan La Paz. We thought, well, why don't I have a park instead and bury the convention center? Because convention centers, you don't need windows. So with that, we won the competition uh, with the city council in collaboration with a developer. And some other nice uh, awards we, we, we picked up along the way with, uh, <clears throat> with MIP as well. All right. Um, okay, more, more awards in, 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 in Vietnam with the um, uh, a joint venture between uh, the Vietnam Singapore Industrial Park. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work for them and uh, not only doing the factories within the industrial park, but they invited us to do residential work as well. And the park is a, uh, it's, it's just that most industrial park, they want to be integrated. They wanted a uh, residential content and this is where we did the work and uh, had a nice surprise that we won some awards as well. Uh, this one I just showed just now, a uh, nice pleasant uh, silver award from Pam. Um, also another one that uh, very simple terrace houses um, for again, the um, Vietnam Singapore Industrial Park that uh, we picked up an award as well. Um, okay, these are some of the earlier work that we did in China, you know, all the way from Guangzhou, Beijing, Wuxi, Guizhou, Chengdu, all right. So once you're in China, you have the whole play field of the whole China wine. All right. <clears throat> so in Thailand, you know, um, we're busy right now we're completing the semiconductor plant. This is why it looks today. And we are another one under construction for a uh, electronic manufacturing services company. Both are American. Uh, also in Vietnam. So uh, we built, this was done 15 years ago. We master planned 2 million square feet delivered a million square feet 15 years ago. All right, this was an international competition. All right. And likewise, uh, for another uh, uh, American company, Jebel, all right, also in electronics. Um, when they bought the, the property, they didn't know that they brought a piece, they, they bought a, a, a piece of water in the, in the Saigon River. So we had to help with the reclamation of the land as well, put in the utilities. Mm, VNG in Vietnam is the uh, Google of Vietnam. So we did uh, their headquarters and as well as a healthcare facility as well. Um, okay, and also a quick one, we, we completed a project in Myanmar, all right? So although uh, it's, it's challenging to do business there, but surprisingly, uh, we had a lot of opportunities. We built quite a few condominiums there in, in, in Myanmar as well, okay. Uh, these are some of our ongoing projects. You know, in, uh, back home, we are building about three and a half million square feet of a semiconductor plant in Kulin. And likewise in Penang, medical device, you know, uh, manufacturing semiconductor equipment manufacturing uh, site. We just broke ground on a, a new uh, uh, power tool uh, factory in the Saigon High Tech Park in Vietnam. And this is a Thailand plant that we just talked about. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that covers uh, our regional office and uh, the, the, the end of my um, sharing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Back to you, Jeff. It's very interesting to note that you are the architect for Gurney Paragon. It's my favorite uh, shopping center now. Okay. And I like how you integrate the old building and then you perhaps one day we can talk about that in another session how to sure. do a good conservation, a repurposing old building. And yeah, that's great. And I, I, I like all the pointers that you've shown. It's very, uh, very in-depth. We'll be talking about that further in our moderation. So uh, that's part of what you've mm -hmm. touched in. We can uh, delve on that much further. So uh, for participants, for audiences, so uh, we are going to have a 15-minute break. Um, so we'll be back at, uh, say, 11.15. Um, meantime, please uh, fill up the question and answer uh, uh, the, the, the section on the Q&A. Uh, there's a button there. You can uh, put in your questions there and we'll uh, present it to the uh, panelists after this, after 15 minutes. So uh, let's take a break now. Thank you, everyone. So we meet at uh, 11.15. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. 
So today, uh, right now, we're going to start off our moderation uh, points, our moderation session. So we'd like to invite uh, David and Ben, and also that to Izumi, if you would like to participate and see how we can uh, discuss further on the matters which have been brought up during the presentation. Most of the uh, points that you've touched during the presentation is especially pertinent to those who uh, were expecting to expand their services overseas. And you have touched on a lot of those in your summary slides, you know, especially uh, David, you, you, you had your 10 points and Ben, you, you came up with several sustainable uh, strategies and so, but for the benefit of the audiences, let's go through some of the issues uh, for further elaboration. And for the audience, uh, please uh, get in your questions in the Q&A section. Okay, um, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the uh, 20 or maybe 10 men firm, 10 employee firm that wants to export uh, services. Uh, so David, you mentioned that size matters. In your, you made it very clear. So to achieve this, do you think that local firms should uh, merge as a consortium to achieve that number? You know, and then start, set up a collaborative uh, brand and then you export your services when you're big enough. Uh, the question goes to you to Ben. Uh, perhaps uh, David can start and then we, we will have a look at what Ben thinks about it, about this issue. Well, if I can start, um, Jeffrey, thanks. Uh, you know, that model of uh, collaboration um, where a number of small firms gather to, uh, um, to deal with a international opportunity, I haven't uh, seen many examples of that success. Uh, I know that at one point there was an attempt to build an organization through something called Malaysia Inc. Uh, which was going to gather <clears throat> all the professionals together. I don't know uh, if it has had much success. Um, I think it's a worthwhile way to go about it. I think it's got some potential. As, as long as the unified uh, organization looks like a unified team, I think uh, potential clients overseas are smart enough to know that if this has been thrown together just uh, for the purpose of a marketing uh, effort. I think it has to be substantial. And I would uh, encourage the smaller firms to em embark on that, uh, but invest in it, meaning create a website that is uh, that brings together that consortium, that collaboration, build a print some marketing material, uh, you know, create an email address that you look like a unified team. Uh, if you do all of the above, you might have a chance of looking like a big uh, international outfit, you know, but just don't come across as being too, you know, Malaysian. Uh, you've got to speak the language of global business. You know, your English has to be impeccable. Um, or if you want to do business in China, your Mandarin has to be impeccable. Uh, if you want to do business in India, your English has to be impeccable. <laughs> right? yeah, well, so you need to understand that. Um, do your research. But I think that's a very viable way to collaborate. You know, in, in, in many of the projects that we've shown in 30 over countries, None of those have been in collaboration with local architects, honestly, to be honest, to be very frank with you. Um, in most cases, they aren't big enough to, to warrant a large, uh, you know, multiple uh, company effort. Uh, some of the ones that we are considering now, especially in Indonesia, uh, if they are uh, successful, like the work that we are doing for Nusantara, the new capital, uh, that will require a number of different um, uh, firms, uh, including local architects, we would be happy to uh, bring them into the game. Um, for uh, just, I'm, I'm pleased to maybe announce here that there is a big exhibition happening in June in Indonesia, Jakarta, called Mega Build, uh, and Matrade will is strongly um, uh, promoting Malaysian uh, uh, interests, uh, not just consultants but also suppliers, contractors, and if. It, Anybody wants to be a part of uh, Nusantara, which could potentially be the biggest uh, construction site in Southeast Asia, uh, I urge you to sign up with Matrade uh, and uh, either exhibit or at least attend 
uh, that, that event because we will be there in strong force. So I hope I've opened the door to that, uh, Jeffrey. The collaboration is definitely a way to go, but collaborate with who? You know, like uh, Ben mentioned, he collaborates with other developers. He collaborates with um, other interests. Collaborating with other yeah. local architects, I wish there was more of it happening. And I applaud this, uh, this, this uh, online seminar because it will encourage us more to think about it that way. Thanks. Yeah, okay. um, thanks for sharing about the market. I think it's a good idea for architects to start registering, uh, you know, into Madrid and find a way to get into the uh, Malaysian Incorporated. And uh, when, Ben, what, what do you think of that uh, collaborative model? But of course, as uh, David says, you have to have a blend. You know, you just come up with uh, architect A, B, C, D, E collaborative and uh, come in and then it looks like some kind of a sales gimmick just to get in. You have to have a, a blend that, that, that unifies together. What, what do you think of that, uh, Ben? Well, uh, I think there are many approaches in terms of uh, how to um, initiate or, or work on a project offshore. I mean, to start with, you know, is I wouldn't encourage you to go offshore, set up shop and wait for the projects to come in. Only flies will come in. All right. The, the better approach is uh, work with what uh, the, the best source of projects is within what you have right now, an existing client or clients, right? And, and if they have an opportunity to go offshore, don't, don't lose that. But one of my things that I, I, I always encourage is uh, colleagues or even fellow consultants to, to, to walk the, to go to the ground. Like for example, when we were, doing a project in, in Vietnam where we didn't know about Vietnam and we were we won a, 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 a large semiconductor project there. So go down to Vietnam, get, get on a flight, spend a week there, two weeks, talk to local engineers, talk to local architects, talk to um, uh, people in government, understand uh, what's happening in the ground, know the risks, know the challenges, all right? Um, and, and from there, you, you, you will visit many architects, you visit many engineers and, and find people with similar mindsets that you think that you can establish a, a relationship and work at least one, two, three years and, and test it out. And I've been very fortunate, you know, my, my local associate in Vietnam, I've been working with him like close to 18 years and in Thailand, successfully uh, been working with him at seven years and they really watched my back. But more important thing is, is uh, from there, you will discover uh, what are things that uh, is simple and what are things that is difficult. And, and with that, you come back and work with your clients and say that, ah, oh, this is what uh, is needed here uh, over that location. This challenge is absent, whereas that challenge is new. And, and trying to, to, to have your, you know, to be honest, I, I went to offshore when my firm was less than 20 people, all right? But the resources that you have right now is not about having a lot of people to produce drawings, all right? But it's to be able to be creative, to give what your client wants in terms of a product and how you produce that product in terms of drawings, uh, execution on site is where you look forward to uh, people to collaborate with uh, the local in China, the local design institute in China, the local the designer do not supervise project, so you need to go to a supervision company. All right, so so you understand the systems there. Uh, in 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 Vietnam, the the it's very tedious in terms of the process of doing permit drawings. It's hundreds of drawings to get a construction permit. You virtually have to go submit your whole tender set of drawings. Leave it to the local architects to do it. All right. So what you could do is share, share the 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 share the fees, share the responsibility, share the risk, and it's okay to to, to let them have uh, the the bulk of it because from there you will learn more. They will share with you more, and and that's where you can be successful. Let the local guys do what they're best at. That I mentioned earlier, what you are doubtful about, that is a risk. All right. And from there you grow. You 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 gain your strength. All right. So it doesn't matter whether you're small or big. The main thing, the main thing is the passion 
to solve problems, to go on the ground and understand where the challenges are. And once you're confident, you know, uh, not only your home office is confident, but they are your partners over there will encourage you to open an office whereby they can actually work with uh, your, 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 your new entity over there. So this is where um, the, the, the seed starts, you know, go to the ground, learn, all right? Um, I, 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 my, my approach to, to starting a practice overseas or export is um, more organic, all right? Starting by knowing where the site your client is going to build. Because the client is going to ask you a lot of things. What am I going to expect? What are my risks? All right, what's my cost? What's my schedule going to be? And can I do this over there, what I'm doing over here? So these are things that you have to answer. And if you don't know, because you haven't visited the site, um, then, it's, then it's a bit of a problem. So you have to educate yourself and the people that's very close to you before you can actually go and uh, do good things. All right, so, so that, that's a different approach. Yeah, interesting. Uh, we are fortunate today because we've got two perspectives on how to export services. Of course, David is going uh, on the uh, large scale and, uh, and Ben is going on the organic growth. So I think these are two important perspectives uh, which uh, maybe the audiences can either relate to. So, but of course, I think that uh, from my point of view, track record is important, uh, right? Uh, that, uh, that's it, for example, we in Puzzle S, you know, we've got Saifuddin uh, um, SNO, we've got Pakat uh, and Raker and us. If we were to come in, we, were, we would be able to put in all our track record together and say we are right now a collaboration, a collaborative company or, 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 or some kind of setup. You know, and then you export it, it will be a formidable thing. And that is also something which other firms can do with their friends. I mean, smaller, smaller firms that has a lot of experience in housing. And then you can come, come up together, pull your, uh, share your risk as Ben mentioned before, and then go into that segment overseas. What do you think that? Yeah, I think it's very interesting the sharing by both uh, David and also Ben. They are at two or different end where actually David established the branding so that uh, the present in any country are noticeable and through acquisition of existing practice, I think that is uh, the many um, uh, firms or even other organizations, business, businesses, I think that's the, the many uh, approach that are uh, used by them. Uh, but uh, something that is very interesting also, what Ben mentioned, that go with a very credible, uh, strong, and trustworthy partner, go together uh, to the um, international market. I think uh, for uh, smaller practices, this is where actually the rapport with the uh, existing client is very important so that uh, you can establish the confidence that um, in future, in any eventuality, if the client want to invest overseas or international market, that you are always in their mind. So what Ben has established is actually showing the new ways of uh, exporting services. Rather than you go uh, for the trade mission, I know that uh, my Dharma trade is organizing a lot of trade mission, missions, but I'm not against it, okay? But sometimes if we go with nothing, or even we, if you do not have a very strong base at our home uh, ground, it's very difficult. I know that uh, I think when uh, Dubai was booming, many uh, practices tried to venture into Dubai, but many of them, I think, got uh, their hands burned okay, because they do not understand, like what David mentioned, culture, regulation, and how they do business over there. So that's why it is important to have a local partners who can tell you more about it. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, about the mega build. Okay, uh, in 2020, we we're supposed to go together. Okay, but I think it was really unfortunate. We already bought the flight ticket, uh, make arrangement, and then it was called off. I think because of the pandemic. I'm happy that uh, just now David mentioned that in June they are going to proceed with it. So we will participate for that. We hope that our members will go. 16 and to 9, 16 to 19 June. Yeah, and uh, uh, David, we really hope that Veritas will bring us uh, together with you because you already have at least uh, 
uh, you are representative over there and you are one of the winners for the scheme. Uh, so that I think it's a good opportunity for our members. Okay, If you cannot go on your own, then this is an opportunity to uh, go together with Debbie or Ben. Okay. In, yeah. in fact, uh, Dato, for, for any yeah. Malaysian firms, uh, no matter how small, uh, if, they, if they have had any um, contribution to Putrajaya, and many uh, firms have, hundreds of yeah. Malaysian firms, yeah. architects, uh, engineers, uh, QS companies, uh, you know, or suppliers, or have contributed to Putrajaya, mm -hmm. you will already uh, be in good position because yeah. they are looking to, um, uh, to Putrajaya as a benchmark for what they want to do. In fact, our scheme for uh, Nusantara was, was greatly inspired by Putrajaya, of course, which we had a yep. role in as well. So mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, now talking about that, you brought up a very pertinent point. You mentioned that you have to be global, you know, uh, shed some of our uh, Malaysian, sort of our local identity. But at the same time, uh, I'd like to ask, what does the international community think about Malaysian architect? You touched about Putrajaya and all that. So is there a benefit of, of you know, while we are globalizing, some of these identity that we are Malaysian architects, how do they look at us? Do they, they look at us the same way as they look at the British, French, Scandinavian, for example? Like, do they, uh, what, what, do, do, what do they think? If you say, I'm a Malaysian architect, a Malaysian-based architect, what do they think? Is it the, uh, oh my God, they're Malaysian? Or do they like, okay, well, Malaysian architects are good, so, you know, how do they look at it from your perspective? How about Ben? You, you go for it and I'll try to answer it after you. All right. Uh, my, my experience, uh, it depends on what sort of projects you're working on. If you're working on real estate projects, um, that, that, that depends on which region you're looking at. Like, for example, in Vietnam, um, we, we have a good shot at that because, uh, number one, uh, we, we, are, we are Southeast Asian, so uh, they, they get a, a, a fairly, fairly uh, comfortable position with us. But at the same time, um, you know, our peers would be like the Singaporeans and um, the Koreans and, and, and uh, this, 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 this sort of level, of peer level. But there's also the, the other peer level that... Uh, uh, they look off the European firms and, and, and the American firms. So, so like, for example, in, in, in Vietnam, when they go out for competitions and all that, um, it's, not, it's not only about uh, being Malaysian, but you must also understand like, that the Chinese, like the Vietnamese or the Thais, they're also very proud of their own culture. All right. So, so I think the, 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 the bar nowadays uh, to, to be recognized internationally uh, being Malaysian and being able to do uh, world-class work is, is, is obviously something that you have to market very well and, and identify with. So, so that's, that's one part there. Uh, obviously, everybody's heard about the, the Twin Towers and Protojaya. But then again, when you compete against your, your other regional peers, they have also equally uh, fantastic projects to show off. But the other thing to market is also to, is to have niche capabilities that your competitors don't have, right? So you have a doing, like for example, you're doing good industrial work. Well, this is one thing that you, you specialize in, all right? Or you're doing hospitals, all right? So don't only do hospitals in Malaysia. Go and do it in, in Vietnam or Laos or, or, or any of the, the emerging countries, you know? That, that, that's where a niche capability comes in. You know, everybody can can design a house and an apartment, but look at promoting your, your niche. You know, so that's, that's where you, you could take advantage on these early days. It's exactly what like China 20 years ago, that was a niche, you know, but today they're smarter than us, you know. So, so we, we need to, um, what do you call, um, so-called grow with the times and, and understand what your, 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 your market uh, uh, expectations are, All right? A bit more on the niche uh, afterwards. You brought up another point. Let's hear from David about that issue with the impressions on Malaysian architects. Yeah, you know, if you go, if, if you're trying to export to countries which are at a, uh, um, not as advanced as Malaysia, uh, then they see us very positively. 
if you go to Vietnam, India, Philippines, Indonesia, most of the countries in ASEAN, um, and uh, uh, they, they, they receive you very well because you are at a more advanced level of development, right? Um, however, it's different if you start to do work in Australia, if you want to do work in the US or the UK, if you say, I'm a Malaysian design firm, uh, they, they will take that with a little bit pinch of salt because they, their perception is that, and you know, perception becomes reality. Yeah. Um, they perceive us as not at the same level of development. And in many cases, that is true, right? So depending on where you're trying to export to, you need to have a different personality. If you're happy to work in Southeast Asia, present yourself as a Malaysian company because that's what you are, right? Um, however, if you want to do work in Australia and the UK and the US, which is where we are uh, also active, we don't go there saying we're a Malaysian company. We don't do that. We in America, we say we're an American firm. We're registered architectural practice yeah, in Portland, sense. and uh, in Australia, we say we're a Melbourne-based uh, architectural practice registered with the Board of Architects in Australia. Now we don't we don't make a big issue that we are small. In Australia, we're very small. In the U.S., we're very small, right? We don't make a big issue. We we sort of hide that fact. What we do is we say we have three hundred over people around the world, which we do. Yeah. Of course, they're not in Melbourne. <laughs> we, we could never afford that. And this is where the this is where the um, the uh, it's important to understand the world has changed in the way we put together things, services and goods. You know, uh, today the the value chain is you need to put things together in places where they're the cheapest. Um, in the old days, you could make a, a computer in America, and that was it. You could make a shoe in India, that was it. But to, today, the world has changed because the chain of, of, of connections comes together. So you find the cheapest place to do something and do it there. So for example, when we do work in the US, very little work is done in the US. Only the very, very front end, maybe five to 10%. The rest is done in cheaper environments, like our, our Vietnam office will support US or Malaysia office will support US. In Malaysia, we get support from our Vietnam, Vietnam office and our India office. That's why our fees are so low. You know, we we follow the minimum scale of fees for that part of the work that we do here. But what we do overseas, we can do it at less than half. Right, because that is the way the world is put together. So you have to think differently. Um, and I think that the design architecture is a little bit old fashioned. We, we, we're still doing things the way we did 10, 20 years ago or 50 years ago, but that's not how the chain of, what's it called, the value chain, um, the, the, the chain of things that are put together, it's different. Financial services, you know, in London, you might get a, a deal done, but half of the work is done in India. You won't even know it. If you hire a legal firm in uh, New York, uh, most of the work is done in Bangalore. So that's the way I think architects need to begin to evolve. Otherwise we'll be left behind. Yeah, we need to think differently. But what both of you have touched in these last uh, few minutes would be the, what in reality would be the niche. You have to find that niche. So uh, now let's, talk about that, about niche. Could the Malaysian architect offer something of a niche that will be looked upon uh, favorably by the interna international community in the form of uh, what we'll be good at? Let's say, uh, perhaps are we better at topical buildings or green buildings? Uh, there, there's a lot of awards going towards that. We uh, direct ourselves as if you are, you are to build uh, buildings which are suitable for the tropical climate, to us, Malaysian architects, or are we better at the industry, industrial section, because we have a lot of uh, industrial buildings here, as uh, Ben, ben Shu said, but all, is it that because of the, the way we operate, we have, we can offer better fees financially? What, what do you think? What do you guys think about that in terms of why? Why would the uh, international client appoint, it has to be a niche-based thing. So, so perhaps uh, some some ideas on that further on the niche aspect. 
Yeah. Uh, by the way, the phrase I was looking for was somehow caught is, is supply chain. Okay. <laughs> it's the supply chain that we need to uh, re reinvent. Um, I think Malaysian firms are uh, very strong in dealing with cultural issues. Um, you know, all the work that we do, we're always sensitive to, uh, well, modernism, but also understanding the rich heritage that we live in today, which is from many, from India, from China, from the West, and bringing all those together uh, in our work. I think that's something we've learned about quite a lot. If you drive around Putrajaya, you see the beautiful buildings, including buildings done by Izumi and by Jeffrey, they've, they've, they've somehow brought in harmony between modern Western planning and technology, but there's something about them that is not Western. There's something Asian in them, right? Whether it's dealing with environmental or dealing with cultural or religious or um, heritage, craft, the beautiful you know, uh, craftsmanship we see. And I think that's something we are very good at dealing with when we go overseas. Definitely one of the strengths. And cost, of course, cost is a big issue. Uh, but let me tell you, if you go to places like Vietnam and India, you're not gonna be able to compete on cost. They're cheaper over there. But if you go to work in, if you do work in the Australia and the US, of course, you're half the cost. And for some people that makes a big difference, but not for all, for many clients, cost is not the biggest issue. Don't not try to sell yourself overseas by cost. Yeah. That is a slippery slope, and yeah. you'll never win that game. Yeah, David, uh, Jeff, can I ask uh, oh, sure. David something, sir? Um, because just now you mentioned that about um, globalization, global branding, unified presence. What about in terms of uh, management of resources and costs? Do you share um, everything with all the the office, for example, uh, for your the international office? Do you share? Uh, cost with them on the project basis for for all for the whole operation of the uh, the office because i noticed that uh, from uh, our previous experience when we venture into um in china office um, at the beginning everything was very smoothly but the moment that um, china become more advanced then we say we used to do uh, um, drafting in china to serve client in malaysia but later we have to do drafting and to supply in China. But it start to change, things start to change when the, uh, they become more advanced and then uh, managing the cost and resources becomes very challenging. Uh, so I'm not sure how you deal with that. It, it, it's what I spend a lot of my time on, uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, the supply chain that we, that we provide. Um, and it's not simple, it's always changing, it's always, uh, you know, um, dynamic. Um, so it's not a, it's a long answer to your question, Adato. Uh, I, I don't want to get into it here, uh, but it's something we all need to think about, uh, the value chain. Um, you cannot do everything here in Malaysia anymore. It, you need to think about ways to do it overseas uh, because uh, fees, fees are an issue. Um, and, and I know that the scale of minimum fees is under attack. Uh, and the only way to deal with that is think, thinking of the value chain, supply chain solutions. Uh, going back to the question of collaboration, uh, which I think is a theme of this, uh, this, this, this uh, seminar, um, uh, the, I'd like to encourage the, the smaller, younger firms uh, here to, um, to think in different ways of collaboration, uh, not just with each other, but also with other uh, engineering firms, with other clients, with other um, uh, partners overseas, because I do think that's the way uh, to succeed in the export of services. If you are small and you're trying to do it on your own, uh, it's, it's going to be very hard. But the opportunities are so great, the, the rewards are so immense, that uh, once you get a job, a big job overseas, you will wonder why you're doing work in Malaysia anymore because you know, fees have just gone so low here. It's, it's, it's become ridiculous. There's no point doing it. I think that's a good point. So uh, talking about multidisciplinary, the subject you just brought up, do those clients prefer those uh, one-stop things? That means you come in together, we solve everything for you in, as it's overseas. I think Ben should answer that more because- yeah, uh, I think Ben, you, you've, you've, you've done that. 
Yeah, actually, to be to be honest, about more than ninety percent of my work is um, on a consortium basis, whereby um, this sort of uh, relationships with, like, for example, my M and E engineers, my structural engineers, and the QS, and and all the specialist consultants that uh, that collaborated over the years. This this is what the clients enjoy and prefers, whereby one stop shop, all right. Single point responsibility, <clears throat> especially on the uh, on the high tech industrial sector, whereby they expect you to do a lot of coordination and and in terms of the contracts you sign, you know you'd be totally responsible for your for your sub consultants as well. So this this pushes you to the boundaries of whereby not only as an architect you have to be a, a team leader and not only become a, uh, involved in leadership issues but also understand. Uh, for example, uh, uh, very complex uh, engineering uh, details. Understand, for example, you know, over the years I've picked up what's the difference between an air cool chiller and a water cool chiller and BRVs. So these are things that uh, you have to have it, have it on the top tip of your fingertips, whereby you, you understand this and you can able to actually talk to your clients confidently, all right? And and obviously your 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 partners. Um, be it local or local, uh, or, 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 or let's say in, in the foreign place, are able to assist you in terms of the local norms. So, so before you can export your services, you have to understand about localization overseas. That's the thing that clients expect of you. All right. For example, a very simple thing: power sockets in Malaysia is three pin. You know, you go off of Malaysia, it's like a different thing. So you think about universal adapters on that. But certain clients, uh, certain countries, they're not even approved by their so-called serum. So <clears throat> there, there are things that you need to attune yourself that put yourself in your client's shoes. They expect you to solve all, your, all their problems by being a single point responsible type of uh, consortium team. So this is where you have to do your homework, go down to the ground and understand what is the expectations before you design, before you build, all right? So, so um. <clears throat> So in terms of uh, collaborating on a, on, a, on a consortium basis, you will have to grow that team bigger, whereby, for example, you're doing an industrial project, you're very close to your client, you know their technology, but you cannot do it, let's say, offshore. So you need a local partner over there, all right? And they'll tell you that this certain compressor, that certain pipe is not available here. Uh, that particular type of, 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 of process, we do it differently. Similarly, like I showed you about structural engineering, there are simpler ways and faster ways of doing it. So these are things that you can actually impress your clients that, hey, you know, this is what I'll do in Thailand. This is what I do in Vietnam, or this is what I do in India. I mean, I, mean, I, I used to do projects in India as well, all right? But over there, construction is different. Um, if you go further out in the rural areas, things are more manual. But there are a lot of high-tech industrial parks in the, in the rural areas because it's cheap. But then again, if you bring in very fancy aluminum cladding, curtain wall, they don't know how to install it there, all right? So you end up working a lot of masonry construction. So, so in terms of uh, your mindset, all right, go to the ground, look at the channels in your head. You know, this is where, this is channel one. Okay? This, is, this is how things need to be dovetailed, all right? Then only come back to your client and promote, this is how I will do it offshore, but you have to be prepared. And, and with your collaborating partners, what you know locally, work with them in terms of having a mirror team offshore. And, and from there, establish a relationship because you're gonna live with them for at least three years in any project, all right? And, and better to have the risks and, and uh, the, the uncertainty sorted out on paper first before you start breaking ground. All right. Interesting, interesting that uh, you have to naturally you, you should go for the local construction, what the uh, contractors are capable of, you know. So in this sense, um, let's go a bit technically or further to that then. How are contracts uh, tied up there? Do you go into the contracts with the contractor or you have local partners or consultants who will... Um, well, yeah. Well, when we do single point uh, responsibility type projects, again, we do first one in, last one out, meaning from design, permitting, construction uh, management, closeout, 
when closeout is not only on permits, but closeout on construction and making sure the last penny has been paid to the contractor. All right. That's where the contractor, uh, the client will appreciate you their total service. All right. Like, like what David mentioned, the, the whole supply chain of services. So you got to have the broad based uh, understanding and to be able to be big hearted enough to, 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 to take on the whole, the whole challenge for like, you know, three years or, you know, in, in that project. This is where your, your, for that three years every day, uh, a local partner, as well as your home base partner will be able to watch your back and, and make sure that everything is uh, synchronized and well oiled. Um, so doing projects overseas is, is fraught with risk. But like I said, you know, high risk, high margins. But um, it is better under your control rather than being having a forced marriage by a client that forces you to marry with this particular consultant that you do not know. And you have, yeah. put it this way, most projects, 70% is human, 30% is technical. You've got to go and solve that, that human issues first before you can be successful. Uh, mitigate risk, I think it's good, as you say, to be part of your own consortium with the engineers and all that because you work with each other mm -hmm. and let the uh, local uh, counterparts to try up contracts with their contractors, right? Maybe something um, that the, we, I, will, I will, for example, structural engineering, you have to go local. They will oh, know okay. seismic, seismic conditions. They will know, you know, uh, hurricane uh, typhoon conditions. They will know availability of materials, local codes, right? So that, that is your resource. So it may be 80% local structural engineering, 20% here, because here you can do the conceptual work, all right? Mm -hmm. But architecture, you can do like 80% of it here. Then your local partner that does 20% to do the localization in terms of products available, um, you know, local norms. And so you've got to look at in terms of demarcating of scope, all right, between your various partners. What are they comfortable with doing what they are at, at best? And what sort of risk do you want to undertake? Having a, a Malaysian engineer, do the bulk of the work going to a ground where it's not familiar with seismic conditions yeah. or, or climate conditions. You know? So, so th this is something that uh, uh, it, it grows with experience, right? But you cannot uh, just sweep it under the carpet because it's going to come back to haunt you because the client expects you to solve his problems. Yeah. Um, I'd like to also maybe move the discussion to uh, an interesting uh, promotion of export of services, uh, Jeffrey, which is that um, unlike uh, businesses which have a product or a, man a manufactured product to export, when you export services, it's, it's in a way a wonderful thing because you don't have to worry about trucks and logistics and uh, ships and uh, customs stopping you at the border. Uh, asking you what is you know duty and all these things, uh, you know we can do work and send it to anywhere around the world, and there's no customs or in, or, or laws stopping us. There are some countries that we export to that uh, have regulations about professional services. Some of them, you know, like India, for example, uh, not let's not, 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 not say India. Let's say uh, Bangladesh. Okay. Bangladesh, which has the same sort of English-based uh, regulations as we do here in Malaysia, they have laws against foreign architects working in Bangladesh, right? Very strict laws. But because we, these are laws which are impossible to, uh, to control, uh, all we need to do is uh, be uh, appointed online uh, for a contract to design a project, provide all the service in Malaysia, send it to them by a click of a button, wait for the payment to come into our bank account, either here in Malaysia or, or elsewhere. And uh, that's it. You know, um, the world is our oyster in, in, in services. If I'm manufacturing something, it'll be very, very different. So everyone who's listening to this, take advantage of the world today. You know, the world is uh, global. You can do work anywhere, no matter what anybody tells you, as long as you have a willing buyer and a willing producer of services. And, and, to, and to make it even better, the last two years of the pandemic, uh, in fact, has been a, the, the, the best thing to happen for professional services, as for export of services, right? We were talking about this earlier before this talk, right, uh, Datu? That, yeah. you know, in the past, if I want to do a project uh, overseas, I'd have to get on a plane, I'd have to, you know, book a hotel, 
you know, sometimes the client would pay for it, but often they wouldn't. Often they would say, this is your, you know, this is your pitch. This is your, uh, you know, this is your um, uh, pitching, right? So we would have to do that. But one of the good things about the pandemic is that the new, the new uh, world, the new normal, doesn't expect you to do that. We can have a conference call just like this, this uh, online seminar. We can do presentations online without ever leaving the comfort of our office or even our home for that matter, and, um, and still be able to provide design services anywhere in the world, irregardless of what that country says or doesn't say about you know, allowing it to happen. You know, uh, the local partners, of course, uh, if we have a local partner, uh, it's their responsibility because uh, they're the ones taking the legal responsibility for what's happening on the ground. And where we have an international office, that it becomes our international office responsibility to ensure that what we deliver meets all uh, you know, safety and other regula regulatory conditions. But it's the best time to be an exporter of professional service, especially from a country like Malaysia, which is generally a low cost environment uh, compared to many other places of the world. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, David. In fact, I think uh, now the world is become, becoming borderless, especially in uh, professional services. So when you sign your agreement in the net, in the cloud, there's no jurisdiction to it. So whether you are taxable, governed by the local um, regulation or the other side regulation, it is questionable. So that's why sometimes people are questioning, uh, you're charging below a scale of fees, but I'm not providing the service in this country. You are providing a service overseas. Uh, you, are, you are not under jurisdiction of uh, the local regulators. So I think there's the advantage. But the, when it comes to uh, construction, then probably it is a physical. I think we lost uh, that you, for a minute. We lost you a bit just now. Oh, sorry. I think it's probably some uh, connection issue. So but I just uh, say that uh, I think there's no way forward in future. Yeah. Yeah. Collaboration can be um, borderless collaboration. It's a cloud collaboration. Uh, so um, even uh, I was thinking that managing tax is also going to be a different way. So, so uh, managing fund, so it's going to be uh, uh, different, so different from what we use uh, uh, to have. Okay. Um, so that's why I thought that why not grab this opportunity? Why uh, the borders are open now to export services, especially on the non-physical. Once you yeah. come to physical build, then it's different. Yeah, that is certainly true. Yeah. So that, uh, since that decision uh, actually answers the question by uh, the, uh, one of our uh, participants here, the Encik Azhar bin Hamza, uh, one of the attendees. So we answered most of the question, except uh, if, you, if you read there, He's asking whether the, whether the local authorities, uh, the equivalent of our Board of Architects Malaysia, are they strict? How strict from your experience in the countries that you practice the uh, Board of Architects there about uh, our services coming in? But like as you said, in Bangladesh, they're very, very strict. How about in other countries that you've, uh, uh, like Dubai and, and from your experience? Ben, you have a lot of experience in China and Vietnam and Thailand. How strict well, are they? Ben, how strict are they? Um, Thailand is very strict. So it's a no-no to use the word architect or civil structural engineer. All right. So over there, I'm a, I'm a facilities engineer. <laughs> right. Because... Yeah, so oh, come with a different name. Eh? Come up with a different... Uh, way, it like it depends on how, how your clients contract with you. All right. If they contract you in Malaysia, okay, they pay you in Malaysia, they, you don't have to worry about that. But you definitely need a local uh, partner there to do all your permits and all your other things. But be careful because, um, you know, it's, if, they, if, they, if you are caught doing architectural services there, it's a four-year jail term. Uh, 
in Thailand. All right. So, so the best way to do that is do apply for a, a license. All right. And obviously, they're putting a lot of roadblocks there. So unlike China and Vietnam, where you incorporate an entity, you can do business. In Thailand, no. You incorporate an entity, you cannot do business. You have to apply for a license before you can actually uh, do your business. And the license takes anything from a year to two years. So, so you have to take step by step and be very, like I mentioned, respect the local laws, be mindful of uh, what can or cannot be done. So that's why I mentioned. That's why I think that the best solution is to, to get a local partner, then collaborate with the local partner. Yeah. David has done. Yeah. You have a local office there, run by uh, your, your, your principals there will be registered in their respective countries. Eh? Okay, now let's talk about some of this uh, litigation thing. How litigious? Do you find that's the authority? Now, how about the culture of the people there? Are they very litigious? Take the cases, for example, where they sue your, your company. How do you go uh, about minimizing such exposures? Uh, maybe, David, you can um, shed some light on that question. Um, I'll give the example of our US office, right? Um, and US is a very litigious uh, environment, as you might know. Um, so Veritas USA is a very small team. Uh, when we do bigger projects, we will work with a larger firm, which we've chosen, uh, based in Portland, who I've, I've identified them. Uh, they are my collaborators. They're not my partners. We don't have a, a uh, joint venture or partnership agreement with them. But um, so we will, uh, my, my USA team will collaborate with them on design, designing the building, but just as a design consultant. Uh, and then the production work is done in Malaysia and sent back to our US office. And then from there shared with the local architect. The local architect, who is, which is quite, quite a big practice with a very strong reputation, they will have to vet through all the documentation that we give them, all the detailed drawings, which is all in the Imperial, by the way. So we have a whole bunch of people in my office who only know feet and inches and miles and yards and that kind of, it's ridiculous, but that's what they do, right? And all the drawings are then vetted by the registered submitting what they call architect of record, who once he signs off on it, takes 100% liability. So even if something goes wrong, we in Malaysia, our, our US office might take some responsibility because they are the ones delivering the work. Uh, but here in Malaysia, we would have no responsibility whatsoever. There's, there's just no connection. Um, so what it means is that the local architect in the US is the one in the front line. And that's just the same as here. If, for example, if we were to uh, do a project in Malaysia and get the drafting, the drafting done in, say, Vietnam or India, which we do sometimes, I cannot be able, if something goes wrong, I can't sue Vietnam and India. Forget it. it will, yeah. It's a waste of time. I'm going to take responsibility, which is why we need to vet through everything very, very carefully. So that's how liability is managed. Uh, so currently we have zero liability for anything that we that Veritas headquarters does outside Malaysia, zero, zero. Headquarters is always um, protected by firewall. Of course, if Vietnam office does something wrong, India office does something wrong, they will be in trouble they would be sued, they would have to defend it. But there's a firewall between that and Malaysia. So that is uh, a positive point to note, that we have no liability for what we produce and send to the local architect there. Unless you yourself have the uh, firms there, then the liabilities would fall on those offices. So those, that's very interesting. So uh, just, uh, there's, there's a thing, about the CCC, I think somebody was asking me to, I mean, of course that's under uh, the local firms. So how many of those countries actually practice this CCC? Uh, I mean, just a short uh, uh, thing, if you can just touch on it, just uh, briefly. I think, Do they still uh, go on the CFO basis? Uh, what about uh, China and uh, Vietnam? Geez. I think none of them, uh, Jeff. 
No, no. There, there, there is a process, but not as complicated as Malaysia. I think most of the, the, the countries that are practicing is more like fit for purpose. All right. And just, just sign off. Uh, sometimes you don't even need to you know, paint the walls, make sure that the fire stairs are there, the toilets are working, and the building is usable. Uh, the authorities are happy with it. Uh, unlike the amount of, uh, of process and, 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 and documentation we need to in Malaysia. So easy. Okay, I think uh, we've touched on most of the subjects. I think for the next few minutes, um, let's uh, go to either one of you to, to sort of summarize again uh, what, what do you think? Uh, I know you have summarized before in your presentation. What would your advice be to those who want to export their CVC? Maybe not, not the full uh, uh, 10 points, but what's the most pertinent? to you in a few, let's say in a few words or in five minutes perhaps. <laughs> okay, it's, um, wow, all right. So first of all, there's a lot of opportunity. So let that be your guide. But um, I, you know, I, I, I don't encourage people to start exporting just for the sake of it, just, be, just because they uh, need to, just because they're desperate. Uh, make sure that you and your people, your team, are comfortable, that they are strong, that you work together, and that you set. And then once you're there, you set a strategy for look, identify countries that have a certain, you know, proximity or cultural affinity, or have a uh, the, the, the 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 quality of the local uh, profession is not as strong as what you can offer. Uh, do your research. And once you've done that, then be selective about where you go. And while that happens, uh, if you get an invitation out of the blue, you know, if someone says, I want you to fly to, uh, you know, Zimbabwe, and we're here, we're, we're giving you a ticket, and we want you to come design a new uh, city for us, of course, take, <laughs> jump at it, jump into it. There's nothing to say don't. But if they say, you please come on your own airfare and give us a free proposal, that is when you really have to be careful because there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, invitations out there which are not real. So do your research um, and be very selective about where you start. Uh, collaborate if you can, that would share the risk. Um, collaborate with other consultants or even with other architects. But, um, you know, be, be careful about, if you're gonna collaborate with other architects, have a clear understanding about who's doing what and who will, be involved in what? Because these things can quickly fall apart when uh, one firm feels that they're doing, taking too much risk or one firm feels that they didn't receive enough of the reward. Uh, relationships can fall apart very quickly. Uh, unless you're very close with these colleagues of yours, be, be very wary. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. How about you, Ben? Well, I, I echo uh, David on some of uh, the points that he just mentioned. Um, do your research, go to the ground and understand the environment you're going to practice in. All right. But at the same time, uh, do the due diligence on your potential customers. All right. Nothing's going to fall from the sky. I mean, this it's okay to be suspicious about the opportunities that's put in front of you, but trust the opportunities that's uh, given to you by proven clients. That one, you, you know for a fact that they believe in you and you work doubly as hard what you do in Malaysia when you go over there and, and invest in it. Take a holiday over there. Walk the streets, you know, and, and see how the culture works over there. Uh, and then the best thing at the end of the day, enjoy the profession as an architect. You know, it's all, all not just work, you know. So when you Practice over there, enjoy that place, but at the same time, learn how people think. You know, the cultural norms, they may be a bit different. And obviously we are all preoccupied in terms of what we can do and what we cannot do, right? So, so the, the only way you can learn that is not from only from the internet. You can do all your research on the web, but go to the ground, all right? Uh, pay the plane ticket, but I think it's a good investment, all right? So my okay. parting guess. That, that's a good uh, advice. Uh, there's uh, one last question. It's more of a statement. 
uh, Muhammad Hisham Sahari, one of our participants, thinks that some of the bigger firms should do their CSR by having collaboration with uh, smaller startup companies, uh, sort of thing. So I think that's a good advice. And uh, yeah, I think we should do that. Yeah, take it, take some of the smaller co new companies under our wing, especially those who just started. So what do you think of that? I think it's a good opportunity because um, we can't, we cannot do everything, you know, like uh, human resource, good human resource is hard to find. All right. So collaborating with uh, uh, people who are like-minded, like you who are prepared for the challenges and, and to, to learn. Uh, so you can take them under your phone. I, I've actually opened doors for a lot of smaller firms and, and shared with them my experience and my local partners there as well. And I'm doing my, old, my local partners a favor in, in the, the foreign country, opening up doors for our local. And at the same time, I can call on them when I need help that saying that, hey, I, 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 need, I need some, some skills on, and, and, and support on, on, on a certain project. And this become one of the collaborative partners as well. So yeah, I'm really open for that as well. In fact, we do it all the time. I think the most effective CSR is uh, the type of uh, responsibility which which goes back to build the entity which is providing it, uh, because then it's a virtuous cycle. The more you give, the more you get, which means you can give more, which means you get more, which means you can give more, which means you get more. It's a virtuous cycle, yeah. uh, circling, circling above. Uh, giving away just for the sake of giving away is doesn't really you know give the benefit to anyone. So the, the, when it comes to collaboration, uh, I like to hire young architects uh, who have a global worldview and send them overseas. I mean, we've sent architects, our, our staff to the US, we've sent our staff to Vietnam, we've sent them to India. I mean, these are young people who've never, many of them have never even traveled outside Malaysia for those who studied locally. And um, they're traveling all over the world, uh, working on these international projects. And for me, that's the more uh, where I should be investing my money, um, building up the experiences of local Malaysians who maybe not had that experience before. And I also do it the reverse. We bring some of our Vietnam staff to our Malaysia office on a rotation basis uh, for usually between one to three months, because that's the maximum they can get on their visa. Um, and, and for me, this is very exciting, you know, to, to build this network of globally minded uh, designers, creative, creative people around the world with a global mindset, as opposed to, oh, I'm from Vietnam, I just concentrate on Vietnam. I'm, I'm from Malaysia, I just concentrate on Malaysia. I'm from in India, I just think about India. The world is not that anymore. And I'm very proud to play a small role to build these strings of connections. You saw, the, you saw my network just now, right? It's like a spider web, yeah? It's a spider web of connections of companies, but also people. Yeah. So I think, yeah, that's, that's good sharing. It has been a very good sharing. We get perspectives because uh, most of us have no clue about how to penetrate. I think what we can say that both of you collaborate with local stakeholders rather than uh, you know joining up with architects and all that. You collaborate with uh, developers, engineers, and the whole host to, to go overseas. And, and in your case, Ben, you, you get it from being a client. Of, I mean, you have, by having a client who is a multinational. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, and uh, David has given a different approach. There's all about global branding, positioning yourself where people will look at you as a global architect. And that's another perspective. And I hope that uh, participants here, those who have uh, been with us from the start, will get some ideas. Some may want to go on uh, David's uh, way of uh, exporting, and some might want to go towards Ben's more organic approach that you grow, uh, you get into a niche. And, and that has been a very interesting talk. Let, let's hear whether Dato Azumi's connection is uh, has been restored. Dato, yes, will you yes. be able to say a few words before we finish off? Yeah, I think it's good sharing. Um, my apology that I cannot turn on my uh, video. I think the connection is not good now at the moment. But I think it's very good uh, sharing. I'm happy uh, to listen to both the 
presenters, the speakers today. I think this is what our members also want to know more. And uh, Pam, I think as an institute, I think should take more proactive effort uh, to probably gather some of the members and guiding them in uh, doing the collaboration. So I hope that maybe this is something that we can look uh, in the future, how uh, we can encourage maybe especially the younger firm to come uh, come up together and uh, get the establishment uh, together and so that we can explore many more things. So thank you very much. Thanks to both speakers. Okay. Okay. On behalf of Pam and also the POP committee, the Promotion of Profession Committee, we hereby thank both speakers. David, Pam has been great sharing. We really appreciate you spending a Saturday morning to be with us. So thanks very much. So that, that will be all from us. So have a good day uh, to all participants and enjoy your weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.